Good morning. Welcome to our regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, if you would please join me in our flag salute, we'll be led this morning by Supervisor Amy Shucklin and remain standing for a moment of silence. Thank you. Please join me in saluting our nation's flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. First item is a Board of Supervisors matter. Take up Supervisor Vanderpool. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a couple of uh, meetings wanted to uh, make sure everyone knew about uh, for this week. Uh, uh, LAFCO will be meeting this Wednesday at 2 o'clock uh, in the afternoon right here in the Board Chambers. Um, the Tulare Prayer Breakfast will be held uh, Thursday at 7 o'clock at the Heritage Complex in the city of Tulare. That's always a great event and very well attended. Um, and then the San Joaquin Valley Insurance Authority uh, has a board meeting Friday at 9.30 here at the Board of Supervisors office dealing with county uh, uh, insurance. So uh, those were just a few meetings I want to make sure everybody knew about. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Yes. Uh, one second here. Okay, here I am. Nope. No, I'm not there. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, let me start with this, uh, Chairman Worthley. Yes. I know you've been here for 20 years. <laughs> Have you moved into District 3 because you parked in my spot this morning? Ooh. Did I really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tow it. Tow it. <laughs> I hope you feel free to move into mine. I, I, I did. I backed right into it. So anyway. I, your spot, not my car, right? Yeah. yeah. No. Right. I, yeah. No, they're towing your car out of my spot as we speak. So, all right. Let me start with um, last Saturday. Um, I attended the uh, Sierra K-9 trials put on by, a, it's a conjunction with Visalia PD and the Tulare County Sheriff's Office. And if you've never been, I encourage you to go next year. It's, it's quite an exhibition of what those uh, K-9s and their handlers can do. Um, but Sheriff Boudreau, he's not here, but he put on a bite suit. And uh, he seemed like such a criminal that the VPD bite dog uh, took a bite out of him too while the TCSO dog was uh, pulling on his arm. So... Uh, kudos to him for putting on that bite suit. How come you didn't do it? I, I would if they wanted me to. Yeah. Absolutely. You, you want to do you'd it too? You'd be a too? great target. I think I would. <laughs> Big target. But um, this afternoon I will be uh, uh, attending the Mental Health Board, and this evening I will be at the Farm Bureau's annual meeting. Um, tomorrow uh, I look forward to uh, welcoming uh, folks at the Mental Health uh, Mini Conference in Porterville, and then that evening attending a COS. Fresno State University uh, reception with Stan Carazone and Dr. Castro and just uh, uh, celebrating the relationship that, that Fresno State has with, with COS. Um, other than that, move your car. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Super <laughs> Supervisor Crocker. Mm, very good. Uh, well, first, uh, they, I, it's been quite a busy uh, week and it's, it's going to continue to be busy. It's that time of the year. Uh, but before I get into the events that I've attended and not, I want to, uh, I want to just give a big thank you. Uh, last week we had uh, a dead cow in the Cahuilla River and Three Rivers, and um, it, it, uh, the Regional Water Quality Control Board issued a boil water notice, and um, it, uh, it took more than I anticipated to get this dead cow out of the river, but I, I really want to appreciate the amount of staff time from RMA, from HHSA, from the Sheriff's Department, and most importantly, the Fire Department and their Swift Water Rescue Team that actually got the cow out of the river. So Swift I Water Rescue did, Team. Yeah. I was I in Humboldt County. Otherwise, I would have been happy to do that. Um, and he was made, snacking. Exactly. You know, <laughs> I, was, I had the munchies. Munchies. So you know. Um, <laughs> But the, the, I, I really appreciate that, and it's, it's, you know, I mean, it's kind of something that's a little bit unusual for counties, but it, that's the type of work that we get involved with, um, that, that communities rely upon us. And so that, if that meant that they couldn't utilize the water um, 
that, that they normally are, are so accustomed to, um, that's, that's something that's a big deal for those residents um, that rely upon that. So they're, they're in the process of getting uh, back to recertification. I, I think they're anticipating hopefully by tomorrow that that process will be uh, complete. So I just want to thank all the departments uh, for helping out. There were quite, it, was, it was quite a, quite a bit of, of, of manpower and, and brain power to try and figure out how to, how to get this cow out of the river. Um, <laughs> I will also be attending the Farm Bureau's annual dinner tonight. Uh, tomorrow I will be speaking at the Exeter Kiwanis. Uh, Thursday is the uh, National Day of Prayer uh, uh, throughout the entire country. Uh, and uh, in addition to Tulare's uh, prayer breakfast, Exeter will be having a, uh, a prayer evening uh, on Thursday. Uh, Exeter is also having its garden party this Sunday evening. Uh, late afternoon and the the garden party is uh, is an annual fundraiser that helps to uh, bring funds in to maintain all the beautiful murals in town uh, as well as as do additional murals uh, as they see fit as they find good fits uh, as there as there's a good nexus so um, it ensures that you know the paint doesn't doesn't keep its luster uh, year after year and in the sun and so it there there are quite a bit of funds needed to to continue to uh, maintain those. Uh, with that, uh, oh, and then, and lastly, the uh, I was I did spend uh, uh, a good portion of the week at uh, the uh, rural counties uh, board meeting, and it was hosted by uh, Humboldt County Supervisor Rex Bone, who's the uh, president of the group this year. And so we were in Ferndale. That's a beautiful uh, town. Um, it was it was uh, you know throwback to the 1890s and uh, the, all the, the Victorian homes. We got the, to see a cannabis packaging facility, which I, I, um, I, I you know, didn't necessarily change my personal views as far as uh, the cannabis industry, but um, it, they, are, they are very sophisticated. I must say there is, there is a level of sophistication that, um, that I, I wasn't necessarily anticipating, and uh, they've, they've got that down to a science, but then again, they've been They've been growing and packaging for the last 40 years, so there's, they're, they're a little bit ahead of the curve on that. Did they send you home with the green tie as a souvenir from... Uh, they did, they did not. This is my own personal... Uh, uh, marijuana. Yeah, that's right. Tie. It's hemp. It's made out of hemp. <laughs> Supervisor I think you got a Green Hand Award. That's oh, right. Okay. <laughs> well, that's FFA. Uh, well, last weekend, uh, we had the Irish Festival in Porterville, and we also had the biggest little rodeo in the west at Springville. So we had the rodeo going on. And uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Dave DeRose, was the Grand Marshal uh, of the parade. And he's, he's a good guy. I've known him for years uh, through the cattle industry. And he works for Hyders and runs their cattle operation, their show steer operation. So great guy. Uh, tomorrow I'll be attending LAFCO, taking uh, Supervisor Wordley's place. Uh, I've got the girls writing me some new jokes, so I'll be able to <coughs> You better have me do it. <laughs> Maybe I should get old and Amy's. But uh, that's all I have uh, that's going on. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, last week, uh, I was up and back one day to Sacramento meeting with um, uh, our technical committee team and their presentation and questions before the Water Commission staff. Um, today, I'll be going up. Uh, maybe for two nights, depending upon the meeting schedules. Uh, this is go time on the uh, temperance flat project. Uh, I you talk about prayer being a day of Thursday. I, I covet your prayers for this because this is a, we've been some pretty tough hurdles in this process of uh, gaining uh, funding from the Prop 14, uh, I'm sorry, from the Prop 1 uh, bill that was passed in, in 2014 to build the temperance flat or to build surface storage water projects. But this is the, the most difficult one because the scoring that the staff has come back with, uh, which is for the public benefit portion, which is the only portion which will be funded by, out of the, um, uh, the state bond funds, uh, has been <coughs> below one. And you've got to be above one to even qualify for any kind of funding. Uh, so um, we are, I will be going up today meeting with our, again with our technical staff. We're going to also be meeting with our legislators up in Sacramento. Uh, and then uh, tomorrow and p potentially into Thursday, we will actually be having the hearings before the Water Commission. So uh, this is a very, very critical meeting. Uh, on a lighter note, last week when we came back from Sacramento, we, uh, we attended uh, the gubernatorial um, debate that took place in Fresno. 
some people saw, I guess there's a small studio audience there, and some people saw, saw me there reacting to certain things. But it was very uh, interesting, and uh, I have to confess that I went in really not having heard any of the candidates speak uh, before, and the fellow that really, I thought, did an excellent job was Travis Allen. I mean, he just had the, he had the best grasp of, of the Tempers Flat Project, and he was very quick, very succinct, uh, very responsive to the questions. So, so it was an interesting experience for me to be there. Uh, so anyway, that's a, really the most important things I was, had hoped to be to going to the uh, Farm Bureau Day. I won't be able to do that because of going up to Sacramento. And um, I think that's all I'm going to say. So we will move on to our next item. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's I'm sorry. Right. You wanted to say something else. I'm well, just, uh, hey, Sheriff, you're here now. You got both hands. I'm glad to see that. Um, also, from the K-9 trials, uh, I purchased a couple of tickets, and I happened to win a new gun. No at, way. Yeah, right there, baby. Wow, cool. A SIG 1911. It's the second time I've won at the Just K-9 trials. Just show it. It's so, on your ankle, isn't no, it? No, I don't have it yet. I had to wait 10 days. So, anyway, I just had to share that also. <laughs> Any other things you want to brag about today? Uh, I don't think so. Right, okay. And I didn't say that I bought I, I won the gun because you parked in my spot. There's no correlation <laughs> to that. I've never won a gun, so I don't know. <laughs> All right. With that, we will move on to item number two, which is always a great event, and this is our recognition of the Tulare County employees who have been selected by their respective departments to be honored in the employee recognition program. And so we're going to announce the employee of the year. But before I do that, is somebody going to make a presentation on this? No, I'm going to start this. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so the procedure is that, that Human Resources sends out employee recognition you know, to uh, information to all of our departments every year. And uh, nomination forms are turned back into HR by the end of the year. They're then reviewed by the Board of Supervisors for a selection of the employee of the year. And uh, before I uh, announce this year's winner, I would like to ask all of those who are present today who have been nominated by your various departments if you would please stand and we'd be recognized. Thank you. And, you know, this is no small thing to be recognized by your peers. Um, uh, as outstanding employees and we have so many outstanding employees in our county. And so I, I, I certainly want to thank them for the work that they do day in and day out. We're very happy that you're here today and that we could recognize you. Um, sadly, we only give out one award, um, and so we will have to limit that. But at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Michael Washam to come forward. Oh. Read the script. Oh, okay, read the script. <laughs> Obviously, we need to coordinate a little bit better on this this morning. <laughs> okay, so here's, here's the script. <laughs> All right. Employee of the Year announcement. Drum roll. It is said that the Employee of the Year has, be, has become a go-to uh, resource for their department. They represent the county with a professional style. They, actually, that person, represents the county with a professional style that has been unmatched. Aside from being an excellent teammate with impeccable attendance, this employee is always on time. This person consistently assists other employees and department, departments with various matters on a daily basis. Exceptional customer service, both internal and external, is what this person is most rec recognized for. It is that same customer service that has led to a significant drop in the number of customer complaints in the department being replaced with compliments instead, of which we got to read some. Members of the public have gone so far as to commend this person on giving them the most efficient service ever received from any agency or government office. Now, that says something, right? I mean, we're not comparing ourselves to DMV, but, I mean, we're talking about all government agencies. <laughs> With over 25 years of service, this person has managed to respond to an average of 700 emails and phone calls every month with little or no assistance while contributing to high and positive morale in the workplace. This person has done this by encouraging other employees to be solution-oriented, working together to help customers. Now it's my pleasure to announce the 2017 Employee of the Year, a person who will receive an extra week of paid vacation. How's that? And their picture out front in our lobby also. From the Resource Management Agency, Samantha Franks. Samantha. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, I, I also wanted to say that, you know, we, we had, like, again, many wonderful uh, nominees, and it's very difficult to make a choice. In fact, it was, we kind of went around, we had round <coughs> robin with the board members of, of making this particular decision. The one thing I wanted to point out that was so um, significant to me is that to have a person who's been <coughs> for the county for 26 years, right, can, you know, to be here that long and still be hitting the ball out of the park, right? I mean, we're talking about batting, you know, 400 here and doing it day in and day out is such a great accomplishment, and I'm just so happy we could honor her this morning. I'll use the mic. And now that you follow the script, you took the few of my lines, but I'm going to go ahead and do what I was going to say anyway. <laughs> um, Samantha Franks is an outstanding uh, employee who provides exceptional service to both internal customers as well as the general public. Uh, for those who haven't had the privilege to work with Samantha, and I do consider it a privilege, uh, you might have, but you just might not have realized it because she's also known as zone information at co.larry.ca.us. <laughs> and again, she, she, she responds to over 700 inquiries each month via the phone, uh, over the counter, uh, emails, and even still an occasional fax now and then. Um, additionally, she produces and distributes our weekly building permit numbers, and that includes for the Larry County, as well as the cities of Farmersville and Exeter. Uh, I could go on giving many accolades, but you know, in, in her abilities for researching and willingness to go that extra mile, but I think it's more meaningful to hear it directly from uh, her customers. So I know Jimmy Kimmel has a bit where uh, <laughs> he has celebrities read mean tweets about themselves, but the RMA is a little bit more friendly, so we take a more positive approach. So I call this conclusive observations regarding uh, Samantha Franks here. The, the following are just a few of the positive comments that I've received uh, via emails or letters regarding her service. Uh, Rod, a homeowner, had written that time was of the essence as I was trying to refinance my home and there was an issue clouding the transaction with the lender. Ms. Franks took the time to explain how to correct the issue and offered to write a letter of explanation to the lender, which she did the very next day. I'm writing to say without a doubt, and I think this might be the same thing, without a doubt the most efficient service I've ever received from any agency, government, or otherwise. I was very impressed with Mrs. Ms. Frank's patience, professionalism, and overall demeanor. Uh, Cynthia, a contractor, wrote, I've been to your office several times in the last few weeks to address solar arrays and pumping sites. I've had nothing but the best customer service from Samantha. I can appreciate the great customer service as I have been in customer service industry for over 26 years with Edison. I came to your office after it had closed. I tried to the door, but it was locked. Samantha noticed and came to the door and asked if I, could, if I needed any help. I told her why I was there. She let me in, found the records I was looking for. It's rare to have that level of service anywhere. Thank you for having exceptional employees. Laura and Anna from uh, a local uh, mortgage loan officers wrote, we would like to compliment your employee, Samantha Franks. She has always handled our inquiries and requests promptly and with professionalism. We, we normal, normally converse via emails and can always count on a pleasant and quick response, usually the very same day. And they conclude with this. We wanted to express how much we appreciate all of her hard work and hope that Tulare County knows the asset they have in her. Lauren Ann, I think the county does. Congratulations, Samantha Franks. Yeah, just uh, real quick, I just want to say uh, uh, thank you to Samantha and really uh, congratulate all of the employees that were nominated by your departments. Uh, that really is an honor to be recognized by your peers uh, in that fashion. Uh, we, we have outstanding employees, and I think that uh, uh, Samantha's story and, and some of the experiences that were shared uh, that uh, various constituents have had when interacting with her really illustrate that, and that should make uh, all of us feel great, which it does, and uh, uh, certainly make everyone that's a part of this county family feel great because uh, we all deliver customer service and we all do the best that we can uh, but know that uh, 
uh, the people out there are watching and they do pass on their experiences and their compliments and they do pass on their complaints. So uh, every day when you are out there, strive to deliver the best customer service that you can and it is recognized and appreciated. So I want to say thank you for all that you do out there. Uh, for all the services that you deliver, and I hope that uh, Samantha has great plans for that extra week of vacation that she's got uh, uh, this year, and congratulations, and it's nice to see uh, uh, the resource management uh, agency uh, recognized for having outstanding employees and delivering wonderful customer service, and I'm glad that Supervisor Worthley doesn't know how to follow a script either, because I might have made the same mistake uh, when I was chair in 2013, so I just wanted to point that out. Uh, yeah, I pretty much echo what uh, what Pete has to say. I think when you look at the big picture for all the nominees, <laughs> although Samantha was the ultimate, uh, when you're talking what, over 4,000 employees within the county to be um, nominated and then singled out as that you know top person, congratulations to you and, like Pete said, to all the employees with the county who are there every day doing the job. Thank you. And Pete? You got to stop putting your name in for the. You're not going to get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Super much, <Russian> Crocker. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I I would agree. We we had um, a lot of excellent uh, candidates uh, to be employee of the year, and um, it was not an easy task. Uh, there was quite a bit of discussion because there are just uh, so many exceptional uh, employees for our county. So. Um, Kudos to Samantha for all the great work that you've done. Uh, I'd, I'd take it a step further. That it's not only customer service, but I think you you provide a great example for uh, not only employees, but us as a board of supervisors, is how to be great ambassadors for our county. Uh, whether we're interacting with our constituency or uh, business folks that are outside of our area, uh, I think the, the idea that um, we that we are encouraging economic development, you know, specifically with RMA, I think that that can only help us to uh, bring additional businesses into our communities and to grow the businesses that we have here. So not only from just a, a personal standpoint, as far as making sure that we treat people with respect and dignity and that we're responsive, but from the from an actual fiscal standpoint of helping to spur additional dollars into our county to make sure that we can provide services uh, for all of our departments, I think it's it's a uh, it's an exceptional quality, and so I think it's it's great that we're highlighting that great work uh, today. So thank you, Samantha. Congratulations, and uh, we'll we'll look we'll look forward to next year and see who what uh, other exceptional candidate we have. Great, Mr. Dennis. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a little difficult when you're the last guy to speak. You know, everybody's talking <laughs> about everything there is to cover. But congratulations, Samantha. Uh, uh, one of the things that that uh, uh, I listened to uh, w during the presentation was you're always on time and that's very important to me coming out of the business world uh, people need to be on time and thank you thank you for the job you've done I, I truly believe that RMA was probably one of our uh, most improved agencies over the last few years I don't get any complaints anymore I used to get complaints all the time about RMA I can't get my permit I can't get this I can't get not now I mean you're probably one of the one of the leaders but I don't get complaints from any of our agencies anymore so uh, I think everybody in this county is doing a good job all those that were nominated you've done an excellent job it's just hard to pick one person when you've got so many qualified people so keep up the good work I mean Tulare County is the biggest employer in the county we're the biggest if you call us a company biggest company in the county so thanks so much for all your efforts and the services that you give to our different communities throughout the year we appreciate it from each and every one of you thank you very much thank you Mike all right this time we'll move on to our public comment period so this is a time for the public to speak on matters which are not on today's agenda but within our jurisdictional powers to come forward and give us your name and address and I understand we have two or three people who wanted to address this during public comment I think there, there's a few that are specific on it. Uh, maybe they're here for a specific, specific purpose, items. in which case we'll, we'll have an opportunity to speak. Did you want to speak to a particular item? Yeah. Oh, come forward then, please. Let's pull that microphone around. So. 
Have your name and address, please. My name is Jessica Camarena. I live at 2696 Shannon Blanc Court in Tulare. Good morning. My name is Wendy Arzaga, physician assistant. Good morning. I'm Farnoosh Karimpur, nurse practitioner working by Salio Healthcare Center. Okay. Um, my name is Jessica Cameron, as I mentioned. I'm a physician assistant at the last Satellite County Clinic in Farmersville, California. As a clinic county system, we have the privilege and honor of working with a very diverse population and those who are most medically underserved in our community. I've been working as a PA for the county for the past four years. During this time, I have seen some very good quality PAs and NPs come and go. We are concerned for the future of the clinics and our ability to keep and retain good providers. It has come to our attention that in comparison to other local low-income clinics, our PAs and NPs are significantly underpaid for the important work that we do in our community. Good morning once again. We see the, some of the most complex patients who require significant time and care from us that our clinics don't want to see. We manage a wide range of chronic and acute illnesses such as diabetes, hypertension, asthma, to name a few, all of which are increasing at a rapid rate. Due to the limited services available from our county mental health department, we are also seeing an increase in patients needing mental health services, many of whom nowhere else to turn. We, have, we help and work with our Moroccan migrant community, sometimes providing free medication and samples of, or connecting them with pharmaceutical programs provided by the company so they do not go without their medications. We also started sensitivity and awareness training for our LGBT community and we are preparing to start offering PrEP treatment for those who are high-risk sexual behavior. For those not familiar with PrEP, it is pre-exposure prophylaxis treatment for <coughs> HIV to reduce the transmission of HIV. Many people travel out of the county to receive PrEP due to the lack of providers in Tulare County familiar and willing to do it. The LGBT community tend to not visit the doctor as they don't feel comfortable about opening to their provider or offering of being judged. As mid-levels here at the county clinics, our goal is to make them feel welcome, safe and comfortable, talking to us about their health concerns. The past two years, we have also assisted the clinics apply for, the, uh, for and getting patient-centered med medical home, PCMH radiation. All of these things could not be possible without caring and compassionate mid-levels. These services and projects are um, in jeopardy if the county cannot keep or hire quality providers. Currently, we are facing a shortage of mid-levels, which will get worse if something does not change. Right now, the county solution is to hire local tenants, which is costly and not good for provide, providing quality patient care. Many of these local just serve for a short time, then leave, requiring new, new personnel to be hired and Retain many of whom have no connections of, to to Larry County and have little interest in the overall health of the community. We have brought these issues to our management and their supervisors, who are all in agreement that yes, we are underpaid for the work we do. Yet they tell us they cannot do anything about it. We have therefore come before you to hear our case. Since the board recently looked into, initiated, and approved equity increases for <coughs> county job classifications, we ask that you consider us as well. We are small in number, but the work we do impacts our patients and our community. Thank you for your time. You know, if you wouldn't mind, your written comments could be left with our clerk. Okay. Uh, it would be helpful to us. Okay. okay. Thank you very much for your Thank comments you. today. Any other public comment? <coughs> Seeing none, we will close the public comment period, take up the consent calendar. Item 11 will be handled uh, separately. Uh, are there any other items which members of the board wish to handle separately? Item 9. Item 9. Anything else? Any from the public? All right. Entertain a motion on the balance of the consent calendar. Move for calendar. approval of second. the balance of the consent calendar. Motion by Supervisor Ennis, seconded by Supervisor Shuckman. Please cast your votes. Votes are unanimous. We'll take up item number nine. I just have a comment. Um, I just want to, you know, we've talked a lot about our facilities here at the county and, and how that has an effect on the morale of the employees. And I'm just happy to see this happening with our transitional living centers uh, because, you know, where you live has a big effect on your morale, your self-esteem, and, and all of that. So I just wanted to give a shout out for, for that, to, to spend that money uh, with our mental health uh, consumers. That's it. Okay, with that, I uh, move for approval. I'll second that. Motion by Supervisor Shuckman, seconded by Supervisor uh, Vanderpool. Please cast your votes. Votes are unanimous. Item number 11. 
I, I asked for this to be pulled um, just for uh, to add in the uh, carbon copy uh, RCRC staff uh, as well as um, the committee that it's located the members the chairman of that committee wherever this bill is I, I didn't get a chance to look at where uh, AB 1795 but we should uh, give that to whatever committee it's in. Might I suggest also that CSAC also be carbon copy? Okay, too. very good. Yeah, very good. All right, entertain the motion then. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Supervisor Crocker, seconded by Supervisor Ennis. Please cast your votes. The votes are unanimous. And now we will take up our items that are not timed. Item number 17 is a request from the Resource Management Agency to introduce and waive the first reading of an amendment to ordinance number 352, the Tulare County Zoning Ordinance. Uh, I want to point out that this has uh, uh, traditionally been something which we would put on a consent calendar uh, because it's actually to set a public hearing on this matter for May 15th at uh, 9.30 a.m. But uh, we will have a brief presentation this morning and offer the public an opportunity to speak to this matter today, but recognizing that the actual public hearing will be held uh, if this is passed on May 15th. Mr. Washington. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, supervisors, County Council. Uh, yes, today we're looking to waive the first reading and set the public hearing date and uh, propose to be May 15th, at which time we'll have the public hearing. So I would give just a brief, uh, very brief update here uh, and summary, and then we can see where we go from there. So today, May 1st, we're, we're set to waive the first reading and set the public hearing, coming back on May 15th for the public hearing and taking final action on the matter. Just to give a brief summary of the project, <coughs> the project is a tentative parcel map to divide a 27.66 acre parcel into three two and a half acre parcels with a uh, 20.16 acre remainder parcel. And to accomplish that, there would also need to be a change of zone for those seven and a half acres from AE20 to rural uh, residential 87,000 square foot minimum. Also, because this is within the Visalia urban area boundary, there would need to be a change of land use designation from agriculture to rural residential. Uh, and finally, there is uh, exceptions regarding the length, width, and turnaround uh, on the private vehicle easement. Uh, fire and public uh, works are satisfied with the design and the condition of the existing roadway. They added turnaround design and found that the exceptions are appropriate. <coughs> I know that some of the neighbors uh, share that share the uh, easement have expressed concerns and, and ultimately propose or oppose the proposed parcel map. So that's just a brief overview. We have uh, a more depth uh, presentation available right now if, if that's what you choose to do. And now I could have staff do that or whatever is your discretion. Uh, unless the board wishes to, I would prefer we wait to the public hearing because we're going to have a full public hearing on this matter. And at that time, you'd basically have to go through this process again. Uh, this is just to set the matter for hearing uh, on that date, at which time we will get a thorough presentation from your staff, from you and from your staff. So at this time, if there are anyone from the public which wishes to address this matter at this time, please come forward. Just use either microphone. Please give us um, your name and address. My name is Phil Clary, and I live at uh, 13401 Avenue 328, adjacent to this particular parcel. And I have five items I'd like to share with you before you go into closed session with your attorneys. I, actually, we, we probably won't be going to closed session today. Well, That's just an mean? option we keep we here. Would ask you to if you could pull that consider. microphone up a little bit, please. I'd ask you to please consider it. Okay? From my perspective, the approval of this project is like trying to fit a square uh, a square peg into a round hole. With all the exceptions and with all the variances that they've requested, it really doesn't fit. Number two, the easement issues associated with this project are not as they, as not as they are laid out in the mitigated negative declaration. There are some significant inaccuracies in the title documents that were provided to the RMA for this project. Number three, it is also perceived by me that your, that your approval of this project is the use of your eminent domain powers for the good of a private party without proper compensation and or due process for me. While I understand, my attorney told me it doesn't work that way, while I understand this is, uh, uh, I, while I understand this, I, while I know that my perception is not the true legal de definition of eminent domain, it still looks like that to me. 
because of how my property is laid out in relation to theirs. Number four, the, the RVLP that has been re redone is still not accurate. Um, point C values, uh, point values, uh, three point value category one through four have not been properly completed as what the form requires it to be done. It, it hasn't been done properly. So we would request that, um, um, that another evaluation be done by a non-local state certified expert to take a look at this thing one last time just so that everybody gets happy with the document because it's currently not filled out properly. And number five, in your resolution 960335, the Board of Directors approved on May 31st, 1996 and affirmed in 2006 in a matter of the general plan amendment, case number 920707, case number GPA 95005, and case number 95006. On page 11 is finding number 26, and it says, quote, case number 38 calls, change of general plan use designation from agricultural to rural residential one, uh, on one parcel 28 acres is inappropriate at this time. The parcel's landlocked position away from major roads virtually surrounded by existing rural residential development requires that a comprehensive plan of the, of the area be developed in order to demonstrate how development of the parcel could be achieved. Case number 38 is a large agriculturally viable parcel, development of which would be inconsistent with the adoption of option two for study area B uh, as described in finding number eight. Finding number eight on your resolution 960335, the finding number eight is on page five. It says, quote, adoption of option number two for study B, Ben Maddox North expands to GPA 74-1, Northeast Visalia Land Use and Circulation Plan. Plan boundary and serves to recognize the existence of, exi of agriculturally marginal parcels directly adjacent to the plan area. Expansion of the plan to boundary allow rural residential development on seven small parcels, some of which are already built out uh, of, to rural residential, and requires that the parcels be provided with, with uh, street layout consistent with 1974 plan. Sir, uh, uh, we I got one more sentence. Okay, got one more sentence. Kind of wrap Option up. number two disallows the property owner request number thirty-eight quals consistent with the finding in number thirty-eight. So I would request that you take a look at it and that you deny the project based upon how many exceptions are there and that it doesn't fit the master plan as in your resolution ninety-six three three five. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Morning. My name is Rod Hoviler. I live at 13401-B Avenue 328, and I'm not going to have a big speech like that. All I have is some <laughs> paperwork for each one of the Board of Supervisors to address later on with Council or at whenever you have time to do, and I thank you for uh, reviewing this. Very good. If you leave it with the clerk. Anyone else wishing to address us on this matter this morning? And, and don't forget, there, there will be a, well, the, the purpose for today's hearing is to set a date for a public hearing. The information that you've given us today will be incorporated, I'm sure, into the uh, report by our staff. But um, please feel, we'd love, encourage you to welcome your coming back when we have the actual public hearing. And the full, full project will be set forward. Anybody else? All right, then we will bring it back to the board. And again, the, the motion is to request a public hearing be set for May 15th at 9.30 or there shortly after thereafter. So moved. Motion by Supervisor Ennis. Second. Second by Supervisor Crocker. Please cast your votes. And the votes are unanimous. Thank you. <coughs> All right. We'll take up item number 18. A presentation given by General Services Agency regarding a proposed solar energy production project to reduce energy cost. We always like that term, reduce cost, at several county-owned facilities. Morning, John. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Spada, Ms. Flores. Flores, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say Mendoza, but I couldn't know. I knew it wasn't Ms. Mendoza. Council. Yes. <laughs> Jennifer. It's one of the Jennifer. Her name right. John Hess, General Service Agency Director. So this presentation is regarding the solar energy production project. So first we'll have a little bit of introduction and background, then go into a financial analysis, then propose project locations, look at the agreement terms, and then go into terms and assumptions, uh, advantages, disadvantages, and end with a sole source request before conclusion and requested action. 
And by the way, we have both the consultant who submitted the proposal as well as the ARC Alternatives consultant here this morning. So the project is a proposed solar energy production project at six county-owned locations with a potential seventh county-owned location to be analyzed further. The objective is to generate ongoing operational savings through 25-year fixed energy rate and distribute those savings to the affected county departments. The projected savings, as we will look at this morning, are conservatively $21 million for 25 years. Initially, in the staff report, there was a uh, figure of 16 or $14.6 million. That amount has been revised, and we'll discuss those revisions later on. The proposal we received was from a consultant. From N uh, Their name is NG. We received that last year. We reviewed that ex extensively with two independent consultants, one a financial advisor, and second a energy consultant, electrical engineering consultant. So they have provided us third-party, neutral, unbiased uh, review of the facts and figures to make sure that we're making a solid recommendation based on those independent figures. County Council has also reviewed the contract materials. And staff, we have consulted with other counties who have undertaken similar projects to obtain sort of a, a thorough 360 review of the project. So ultimately today, the action will be to seek your direction to proceed with the project and program as proposed this morning and then come back with a final contract for execution in a few weeks. So specifically, the proposed project includes installation of ground-mounted and canopy-mounted solar panels at six county-owned sites through a power purchase agreement. Further analysis is recommended for the seventh site at the uh, Civic Center East property. Here at the Civic Center, which is all of the property this side of Mooney, we've sort of conveniently divided it into two sections, that which is east of Woodland and that which is west of Woodland. The western section, which we're in now, is much smaller. The eastern section has the courthouse as well as the main jail, so it's much larger with respect to its energy consumption. That particular part of the property initially had a financial loss. As we've looked at the numbers much more thoroughly over the last month and a half, as, as recently as last night, and we've got some updates from last night even in the presentation this morning, that amount has gone up. So we're now seeing a positive return for that building where previously we saw a loss. So we would also have two battery storage devices to be installed at the Tulare Acres Center as well as the juvenile detention facility, potentially a third one at the Civic Center East property if we proceeded with that project. What that does is it allows for us to shave off some of our peak demands during inclement weather or variable building demands. Rather than going to the grid, we're able to go to the, the battery storage device and still offset our, our costs. The total project site is 9,402 uh, 9, kilowatts or 9.4 megawatts for all seven sites. A paving allowance is something that is offered in these projects that we would be considering and bringing back with a firm recommendation at the final conclusion of this at a future board date. Specifically, the two sites, uh, Civic Center as well as Government Plaza, have extensive paving needs right now. And then after the canopy-mounted uh, solar panels are installed, they would still need to be restored. So potentially we could uh, put the cost of those paving reconstruction projects in our per power purchase agreement, thereby allowing it to be financed over the term rather than putting that money out right now. So I'll have two tables. One is one here that was shown in the agenda item from March, and then I have an updated one that includes the figures again from as late as last night. So you'll notice first all the locations, the first one being Civic Center East, which is still under further review. The second column is the power purchase agreement pricing, the contract price that NG has committed to the county for both the solar and the storage, meaning that there's three sites that have solar and storage, and so that rate includes both of those figures. So it's a little bit apples and oranges, but it's the best way to get an aggregate amount across all of the sites. The next column is the solar panels uh, kilowatt size. You can see there's different sizes, as small as 396 for Civic Center West, as large as over 2,000 for Civic Center East and Bob Wiley. The next column is the energy storage battery size to offset the load smoothing. The, the next column is perhaps the most important, or at least the primary objective of the county and why we'd be considering doing this, which is the financial savings over the 25 years. As you can see here, is $14.6 million. Initially, Civic Center East had that million dollar loss. We have done extensive review of that figure with a lot of um, analysis on the part of k and financial advisors, ARC, as well as NG. So what that has resulted in is on the next slide, a reduced price from NG has brought their PPA price down quite a bit. And um, all, another factor that I'll go into on the next slide also addressed that uh, positively. So you can see now the aggregate has gone up, or the total <coughs> benefit for the county has gone from about 14.6 to 21.4. So six and a half million or six point some million dollars increase for the county based on those revisions. So again, the notes on the financial analysis being that it is part of the most important part of the project, 
First and foremost, as NG did reduce their PPA price for Civic Center East, which obviously increased its financial value considerably to the county. The production models for the entire analysis were also modified, corrected, we should say, by one hour. And this gets a little more technically complicated, so we do have ARC Alternatives, the, the electrical engineer, to uh, answer any questions that come up that may be of a technical nature or specifically regarding the rates. But very simply, the um, utility companies are working with the CPUC, the California Public Utilities Commission, to begin new rate billing structures. And this is going to be across the board, residential, institutional, commercial, and so forth. And what that'll do is there'll be higher rates during peak hours, peak hours being defined as about 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. We, as a, as a you know, institutional organization, we obviously operate more in the 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. So we actually would still see a benefit of the time of use in general, maybe not as you know, significant as what we're seeing here. What we did to correct is shifted an hour into the last hour of the day, which means we're then subject to a little bit of the peak rates, thereby increasing the value of our solar project because now our locked rate gets lower compared to that increased new rate. So each site has been accepted into a time of use exclusion for 10 years, which then means the rates will increase significantly after year nine, again, increasing the financial favorability of this overall project after year nine and as the years go on. So all of that has sort of created a general aggregate favorability of the value of the solar project to the county. One final note, if you notice, juvenile detention facility is much larger uh, of a financial benefit to the county than the others, even though it has about the same megawatt size. And that's because it's in the PG&E territory. It's the only property in PG&E. Everyone else, all the others are in Edison. And PG&E has more favorable structures for, for solar uh, pricing. And again, our consultants can go into more details as to the specifics <laughs> of that. So the proposed project locations, these are just proposed at this time as to how they would be situated at the various different seven <coughs> county facilities. You can see there's a variety of canopy mounted and ground mounted. Ground mounted is cheaper and more efficient. Gra canopy mounted is a little less efficient, a little more costly for the consultant to build, but they have ancillary benefits <coughs> such as providing shade to staff. Right. So here at Government Plaza, you'd see canopy mounted there, still protecting much of our property in the trees. <coughs> At the, at the uh, Tillery Acres Center would be, this is sort of situated, uh, north is to the right, so this is situated to the, to the west of the building, behind the building, so you wouldn't, it wouldn't be uh, super obvious from the Acres Boulevard there. So you also have Bob Wiley Detention Facility to the south of the adult pretrial building, that's the main building in the center. This is the Civic Center West where we are now, so it would be canopy mounted on the existing parking lot. I noticed, <clears throat> John, on that one, on the east side there, there's no canopies. We can uh, make sure there's some over. Uh... Except over number four. <laughs> Skip number four. Put a magnifying put a glass on that part there. <laughs> Moral canopy. So uh, this is the JDF, the juvenile detention facility, ground mounted there. South County Detention Facility, this is obviously an aerial photo that was before you know, the initiating of construction, ground mounted to the north of the property there. So now the type of contract that we are proposing for this program, there's a variety of different uh, delivery methodologies. The one we're proposing is a power purchase agreement. And what it does, there's a couple of benefits to the county for this. It primarily, NG owns, operates, and maintains the solar panel system throughout the 25-year life of the project. So we do not have any uh, responsibilities for maintaining them or operating them or anything of that nature, which is a good way to mitigate against our risk. In addition, the county acts as a host consumer. We execute a ground lease with them. We do not provide our property as collateral. So we don't have to entertain debt financing, and we don't have to put the property onto which those are situated as collateral to their construction financing. We just execute a lease, and that's the only form of property encumbrance that we have, which would, of course, be inherited to future inheritors of the property. Uh, the county would be the big um, hook of the project is the county is contractually obligated to purchase 100% of the power produced by these solar panels. So that's a very specific and important distinction with the power purchase agreement. So the next slide will go into a little more detail as to how those implications then, uh, when you engineer the sizing of the project, has to be very deliberate and intentional as to not over-engineer it. Because we're on the hook for all of the solar panel power. So here is the, all the locations yet again, and the same kilowatt size of each of the locations. What's new to this table is the MG solar production kilowatt hours per year. That is the amount of power that would be produced by each system in the first year. That would degrade over time, and we have a, de a degradation factor we'll go into in a little bit here, but in year one, that's the amount that would be produced. The next column shows right now, based off of all the data we pulled for the accounts, 
the annual utility consumption for those same sites. The final column and the most important column shows the site load offset, which is to say how much of the consumption that we've, that we've calculated now is offset by this solar project. You can see all of them are about 63, 67. There's one higher one for Bob Wiley, 64, 67, 68. So they're all about that two-thirds category. One, there's a couple strategic reasons for that. One, obviously we don't want to overproduce on a situation where we have to buy unnecessary power. Two, we want to have a little bit of buffer so that if we come back into energy efficiency projects and drop our consumption down, there's still even more of a mitigated buffer. And that's the reason why Bob Wiley is at 78% because we've done some analyses there and we don't believe there's a, a significant amount of more savings that could be generated through efficiency projects. We already have a few efficiency matters in place there that would address the main uh, electrical consuming uses. So again, this is perhaps one of the most important distinctions of this type of agreement. So the benefits and risks associated with a power purchase agreement is first, the county does not have to obtain debt or finance uh, the construction of the panels. We do not have to encumber property as collateral, ex certainly not as collateral. The only encumbrance would be through a, a lease with NG. The county pays a fixed energy price for 25 years, so no matter what happens in the energy market with respect to time of use or phasing in or out or CPUC changes, we would have a fixed rate for that entire term of the 25-year contract, which is, has value in and of itself. The county is not obligated for the operations and maintenance of the system, as mentioned earlier. The county would receive 100% of any production benefit from the panels after the PPA term. So the value of that is, although there is an annual degradation assumption of these panels' effectiveness, there's still some useful life potentially after the 25 years. If that's two, three, or five years, or even 10 years, the county would receive 100% of the financial benefit of those years. So that definitely, although the financial analysis shown previously does not include that benefit, that could easily be 10, you know, up to $10 million if it goes up for another five, 10 years beyond the 25-year term. Finally, NG provides a performance guarantee for 90% of the panel's production. Again, another uh, important part of mitigating the risk exposure of the county, which is to say if we looked at the slide previously, that uh, production uh, projection that they forecasted, if they failed to meet 90% of that, so if they, let's say, make 80% of that per site, they would have to credit us the difference between 90 and whatever they make 80, so that'd be 10 in that, that particular example, towards our future statements. So that would offset our future payment costs on, the, on our future electricity bills. Finally, the risks and disadvantages of the PPA are one, and this is definitely the biggest uh, consequence of this type of agreement, is we are, we are contractually obligated to buy all of the uh, power that is generated by the solar panels regardless of our consumption needs. So that's the most important part of sizing these particular uh, projects. The solar panels may degrade more quickly than assumed or not experience useful life of 30 years. It's hard to say. There's a lot of different um, opinions, let's say, regarding the useful life of a solar panel because a lot of these have not been deployed for 30, 40 years, so it's hard to say will they last that long. Hopefully the technology has gotten better as they've been deployed out in the field, but nevertheless, there's always a risk that they may not perform as we would like them to right now. Finally, one of the disadvantages, although it also ha it's necessary for us to receive the full benefit after the 25-year term, there is a lump sum payment that the county would have to make at the year 25 to own the property, to own the, uh, the system free and clear. So quick details regarding the terms. The agreement price on aggregate, uh, aggregating all the seven different sites and the storage facilities is 10 uh, cents at 79, 10.79 cents. The agreement term is 25 years. The estimated buyout would be 910,000 in year 2043, so that's, you know, that's uh, many, many years down the road. M Mike and Steve are really concerned what 2043 <laughs> looks like. Yeah, and that's, it would not inflate, that's the amount, so we would be <laughs> locked into that amount, whatever that would be in, in year 2043. Oh so so the annual utility es escalation that we've included in the uh, project is 3%. There are um, different uh, analyses use different factors and some use as much as 5%. We were more comfortable using 3% because that is a little more conservative, and although it does decrease the projected savings of the project, it at least, um, we can stand by the projection that comfortably they would increase at least 3% over the next 25 years. Annual solar degradation would be half of 1%, as shown er, you know, previously. So one of the um, requests that we're putting forward today is a sole source for NG uh, to proceed with them as the solar consultant for this project. This is in accordance with the section 4217 of the California Government Code with the legislature enacted several years ago, seeing the benefit of that uh, 
provision being there for counties to take or municipalities to take advantage of. It's a common practice that uh, municipalities have used for solar energy production projects. It does take extensive time and resources. Up to this point, we spent well over a year and a lot of it, you know, time and resources invested to get us to this point. If we were to engage in, a, in an RFP process, which is an alternative that could be considered, that would require us uh, getting an electrical engineer on board to put the actual drawings, <coughs> specifications, technical documents together, have those reviewed, put out to bid, review, you know, going down the regular public contract code process, which um, in a conventional construction project is a six month process. Now with something of this magnitude would be probably greater of that nine to 12 months. So it is a time savings recommendation at this time. To highlight in conclusion the summary of the program benefits, it would generate an estimated $21 million of savings. Of course, that could be much greater depending on all sorts of factors, as much as $50 million, depending on how much the utility rates escalate, as well as uh, the amount of useful life after we purchase them free and clear. These savings would be passed on to the affected departments who are housed within each of those facilities. The project locks in a fixed electricity rate for 28 five years. NG would utilize local contractors and subcontractors for the installation. The county has no operational or maintenance responsibilities for 25 years. So in conclusion, because of these financial benefits, staff recommends proceeding with six of the proposed seven locations and two battery storage facilities and returning with a final recommendation regarding the Civic Center East at time of contract approval. Based on the information that we've uh, analyzed again as recently as yesterday, I believe that's going to be a favorable recommendation for that site. But that's at the time of putting this staff report together, we did not have that. Now it appears to be much more moving towards the favorability part. So the final requested actions are to receive this presentation, approve proceeding with the sole source consideration in, in accordance with Government Code Section 4217.1 with NG Services, and direct staff to proceed with contract negotiations with NG and return with final contract approval as soon as practicable. Thank you. I had a couple questions that I know other, other members of the board will also. Uh, so the, the annual utility escalation is an assumption of 3%, but there's no actual rate increase from our purchase with them. It's a flat amount for 0 0.1079 per kilowatt for the, for the entire 20 year period? Correct, for the 25 years, right. and that's an aggregated number. So the seven sites each have, some are in the eight or nine cents, some are in the 11 or 12. So on aggregate by the actual kilowatt hours consumed, it would be 1079. When I entered into a, a contract like this for my home four or five years ago, a different world, I paid 20 cents and was happy to do it. So it's, yeah. it's amazing how it's come down. The other thing I was gonna ask is that um, we don't necessarily think about this because we think about, we know that these, uh, there is a, a sense of uh, breaking down over time, uh, which is accounted for, and then there's the opportunity for us to purchase them at the end. Is that a, is that a fixed amount or is that a negotiated sum in the, fu in the future? It's fixed through the contract. So we would know it right now, and we could theoretically, of course, put that aside in a fund to gain interest over the 25 years or, you know, at this time, if we were desiring that, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, the other question may be a little bit strange though, but. So what if we decide we don't want it? Is there an obligation for them to, because I mean, ultimately, it's like an old car, right? <laughs> it's great when you use it, but over time, there comes a point in time which is a liability, not an asset. So is there any obligation on the part of, in, of the company to dispose of these at the end of the contract? So my understanding, and uh, NG could probably answer this as to what their, how their company would be interested in negotiating that. My understanding, that there's a couple different options. One, if the county doesn't want to buy that out, they can pull them out and then go, you know, go on with them and uh, restore the property as if they were never there. Or two, we can renegotiate a new PPA rate and assume that there's more useful life out of them. That's probably less likely to be the case because the buyout price is so compared, relatively low it would probably not be worth to continue on with a PPA uh, contract with them at that 25 years. Okay. Supervisor. A C couple oh. questions and uh, uh, comments. So first of all, I just want to thank staff uh, for uh, all the effort and work that went into this. Uh, how, how many strategic uh, space planning ad hoc committee meetings did we have to get to this point? Like five we've or six. About this. <laughs> um, we, we spent a very thorough time uh, uh, vetting this whole thing. Uh, so I appreciate all the effort that went into it and definitely the uh, consultant for all the effort that they put into it. A um, couple things I wanted to uh, ask. Uh, the historical trend utility cost increase, uh, what, what has that been? I know we're assuming uh, 3%, which is more conservative than 5 going forward. What has that uh, increase been historically? I would want ARC to answer specifically, but in its, uh, so if, if Russell, Mr. Russell Driver, Russell Driver can make his way up here, that'd be great. Uh, we used to 
generate those figures, there is a 10 year and a 15 year analysis. And I think that changes the, the overall escalation sure, figure. Sure. I, I was just kind of curious, making sure that we're, you know, in making this decision, we want to make sure our assumptions going forward are uh, founded. Yeah, either way. Ron. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, the utility rates bounce around quite a bit. And so um, one of the funny things I've learned over the years is, is it really matters which window of time you pick. Sure. Um, over the last 10 or 15, it's been north of 3%, but not quite 5 Okay. And so what we try to do is use a number that's more aligned with what the Public Utilities Commission is using for forward-looking planning. Sure. And that number's closer to 4 Okay. So, so, so assuming, it's assuming 3 is very conservative. It's conservative. So that's, I feel very comfortable with that. Um, on the, uh, uh, when we, as we look at the, I, that, that's it. Thank you. Uh, the, um, uh, East, the, the uh, East Civic Center uh, mm -hmm. project. Um, when we look at uh, the potential for abandoning the, ma the main jail and transferring uh, our inmates out of that facility and maybe not using that, um, has that been uh, included in our uh, assumptions? So I'll have to go back and check to see if those accounts were included, but that would definitely uh, change, Affect that would alter that particular site. So I want to make sure that that's needs. included. Um, then on the South County Detention Facility, uh, when we make a, a projection and assume what the energy use will be out there, um, I, I actually feel somewhat comfortable with those assumptions just based on the fact that we're not uh, producing uh, an amount that would totally offset the energy needs at that facility. Uh, but I wanted to uh, uh, just make sure that uh, we were uh, really accounting for, not, not basing it on a facility that was, say, constructed in the 80s with maybe a lower, lower energy efficiency. And when, as we build the South County Detention Facility, I assume that it's going to be uh, under the newer energy efficiency requirements, and so we won't necessarily be consuming as much. So I just want to right. make that point. And then uh, lastly, uh, I'm very comfortable uh, with sole sourcing in this uh, instance. I think that uh, uh, NG has invested a significant amount of uh, resources and time putting together this proposal for the county. Um, they, they've been very, very responsive over the last uh, a uh, year plus that we've uh, been doing our due diligence on this uh, and, and have done a lot of their uh, work up to this point free of cost. Well, all their work has been free of cost to get to this point. Um, and I know that they have uh, experience with numerous jurisdictions uh, around us and around the valley. Uh, and I feel very comfortable with their uh, track record uh, on this uh, uh, solar front. So uh, those are the comments I wanted to make. Anybody else? Yeah, I have comments. Okay, I'll just piggyback off of that one. I'm not on the committee, but uh, so I, I take what Supervisor uh, Vanderpool says. But from the beginning, why did we not do an RFP process? So really, this was something that uh, this company came to us and had engaged with us unilaterally and wanted to bring this as a proposal to us. We engaged, our, as soon as that happened, we brought in the external advisors to ensure that whatever they were proposing was consistent with and had, you know, uh, verifiable data associated with it before bringing a recommendation here. So um, it wasn't really something we were in the in the market for necessarily, and that's okay. probably why we weren't uh, outside doing RFPs for it. Sure. And, and yeah. real quick, let me just, because yeah. I've been a huge, huge proponent of an RFP process. But as we've seen, uh, some of the major players that have existed in the solar uh, industry are no longer here. Uh, so having a company with, with the track record um, and, and stability that NG does uh, makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. And so that's why yeah. I've been willing to, to take a step back on that. Okay. And then I sent you an email <laughs> that I got from a constituent yes. just um, inquiring. And, and first of all, I always love when that happens because it shows that the, the community is, is watching us and, and taking an interest. So uh, with that, one of the things that they pointed out or asked about was the potential of the, the peak hours changing and not being so much during the business time. Does that make sense to you? With the yes, absolutely. And that's the discussion we had this morning as soon as I saw that. Okay. And, and so in that same slide that I was discussing earlier, it is definitely a very important material part of how we've constructed the analysis over the last couple of weeks. And it was something we, we had multiple discussions among our consultants as well as with NG as to how we would conclude that because there are some um, municipalities that would engage in this analysis by not considering that time of use. So it's which, already been considered. It is. That, it's that already those included. changes are going to be... 
made in the future, more than likely. Yep, all the analyses presented today include all of the time of use changes and the CPUC as, as presented and filed at the CPUC right now, all those changes that are gonna be taking place that we, we would be subject to going forward. Okay, and then my last question um, on, the, on the areas, especially out at Bob Wiley where we're showing the ground use, is that gonna affect the, the jail farm at all by having that taken out of use for so production? So we've had, we've had conversations with the sheriff's office and they have the ability to, uh, they have some flexibility of, of property to let that be utilized for the solar project. So no, it would not have an impact that would uh, reduce the effectiveness of their farming operation. Okay, thanks John. Sure. Pleasure, Clark. Um, yeah, so I, I um, this is something that I've been very interested in for over a year, uh, considering uh, that I used to be employed by Pacific Gas and an electric uh, company. Getting you back at them now? Uh, yeah, get, no. <laughs> hey, well, we are getting the most favorable from the juvenile detention And you've facility. divested Just, all your stocks? I divested all my stocks over a year ago. Uh, so this is, uh, which was good for other reasons, but uh, I won't go into that today. Fires. Um, yeah, that's the main one. Uh, a few thing, comments that were made, uh, I, I believe that um, there was some process uh, that we actually, uh, or a little bit of background before I get into that, we, we were trying to take advantage of a federal uh, low, uh, low interest rate loan uh, via the Krebs program uh, that kind of uh, initiated that and that was looking at um, closing down, there was a lot of, there was only so much money set aside in that funds um, and so that was kind of one of the main drivers to move this forward. Ultimately, with the uh, with the tax law uh, uh, changes that happened in December, uh, that the that program was uh, one of the uh, casualties of it. And so, um, which which has required us to kind of shift our our focus. Um, one of the things in the committee I think we've discussed is that. We weren't interested in going into debt uh, for this type of project. So uh, certificates of participation was not something that I was interested in as far as funding this project, which is why we looked at the PPA, uh, the Power Purchase Agreement route, which uh, we have uh, vetted and it looks very favorable to us. Uh, it's, it's very, uh, very attractive um, as, as Supervisor Worsley is now probably a little bit upset with his own personal <laughs> uh, <laughs> situation. I think that with the in, in regards to the, the possibility of the demolition of the main jail, um, something that wasn't discussed but that, that I have found out that there is a cogen site uh, at the main jail currently and that useful life is coming up to uh, a close in the near future. So. Uh, Actually, I think that there is minimal impact as far as the Civic Center East, how that will, will take into consideration for the main jail because the, um, because the cogen uh, generates a lot of power, a lot of electricity for that site currently. So um, if, the, if the useful life of that cogen facility is, is going to be near its, its, uh, its end, then, then that kind of mitigates uh, whatever, uh, put, you know, whatever future that the main jail has. Uh, I, in regards to the farm, uh, something that we ne haven't necessarily uh, discussed, but um, you know, that, that is all white area uh, that, that we have, which means that there is zero surface water. So it is fed via pumps and Sigma will impact that. And so in, in, in actuality, this will benefit that because we're going to take out land that's going to have to be taken out of production anyway, and we will give it some type of useful form. So I, um, I, it's, I don't think that's really been discussed, but I, that, that is, um, I think, ultimately beneficial. Uh, just as on raw numbers from my previous past, 3% uh, was something that we always said was kind of conservative. Looking at a much longer term, we would look at a 30-year plus, uh, you know, rate of escalation. And uh, I, I under, we, we know that the recent past, there's a, there's a shift and there's been a change. Um, but from a conservative standpoint, I think that's the case. The, there's really no negative because we're not locking ourselves into one versus another. It's simply providing scenarios. So if the rate of escalation increases, then that only benefits us more. It does, our rate is based on a flat rate per site. 
So it's, it's not necessary. The rate of escalation just kind of gives you a picture of what you might save, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't affect it, the savings uh, one, one way or the other. Um, and then uh, lastly, I, th I think we, you know, we touched a little bit on the energy efficiency, but we've, we've got to do that. I mean, we, this is proposed uh, to incorporate some type of energy efficiency. Otherwise, these would be larger projects. But I know that we've got a lot of opportunities to do additional savings. Typically, energy efficiency is more cost-effective. Uh, way of, of saving uh, on on our, uh, our our utility costs so um, so I, I would like that uh, to be a part of the negotiation project that that that's incorporated in with uh, with the with the final proposal absolutely great uh, great proposal this is something that I'm hoping the county was looking into a long time ago we've seen private business going to solar most of our schools now have large solar projects. The storage battery is excellent. That's the way you keep your power level, even when there's uh, cloud cover and uh, you don't have the uh, efficiency from the solar panel. So great project. I think it's, uh, it's got a lot of merit. Thank you. Thank you. Here, so one, one last thing, uh, John. I think you touched on it, but I just want to make sure I understood it. Uh, we're, we're obligated to buy this power, and, of course, it's not a problem when we have 24 hours facilities like our jail and so forth, but in a typical office building where we shut down for the weekend, then do we have opportunity to sell that back to utility companies? I don't believe so. I think it's they, if they generate surplus, they would sell it back to the utility companies. Can I respond to that? Yeah. Um, yeah, all of these systems will be hooked up under what's called net energy metering. Oh, okay. Which right. means that you can push the power back out to the grid and get credits for okay. it. Okay. So that's, long that's as over the know. period of an entire year, you're not producing more power than right. you use. Right. Okay. okay. That's, that's really good because that, that was a concern I had. Okay. I was thinking we might have be producing power, which we weren't using and not getting any way of benefit from that. So very good. All right. Any other questions, comments? If not, entertain a motion. Uh, Any public uh, public comments on this matter? All right. Move to approve. Motion second, by second. Supervisor Kyler Crocker. <laughs> Seconded by Supervisor Vanderford. that beat you to it. Okay. Please cast your votes. Which are unanimous? Thank you, John. Thank you. John, good for the Thank you uh, to the to the to in energy for bringing this to our attention, and I look forward. To anytime we can save money, that's eight hundred grand a year. Our department will thank us as well, budget time. Hmm? Yes, good morning. We are now on to our next item, which is number item number 19, request from the Board of Supervisors to appoint the district's uh, suggested appointee, Sandra Mraz, uh, to the Deer Creek Stormwater District or appoint another applicant and make a finding stating the reasons for the board's selection. Good morning. Good morning. Um, board, CAO, Council, Clerk, um, Julieta Martinez, Chief of Staff to the Board, to give you a brief introduction to this item. Recently, the California Attorney General concluded that a single vacancy on a stormwater district should not be filled pursuant to Government Code Section 1780, but instead follow the Stormwater District Act of 1909. Following that recommendation, the Deer Creek Stormwater District submitted a resolution showing formal action of their support to appoint Sandra Moraz to the current vacancy. The Stormwater District Act of 1990 <coughs> also provides that if the Board of Supervisors does not make the appointment as recommended by the Board of Trustees, then the Board shall make a finding stating the reason for their selection. Today, I will turn it over to Supervisor Pete Vanderpool, who will share the finding. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm happy to uh, make the uh, uh, comments uh, that uh, uh, regard the finding that was made by uh, myself in, uh, in, in, in proposing to the board uh, regarding this item. Um, the Storm, Deer Creek Stormwater District's Board of Trustees has suggested that the Board of Supervisors reappoint Sandra Moraz, who had previously resigned from her position on the district's Board of Trustees. The clerk of the board posted a notice of vacancy after her resignation, and we have since received several applications for this position. Today, I'm recommending that the Board of Supervisors appoint the applicant Shirley Paddock. 
Shirley has many years of service in the water and irrigation district industry, previously working for the Corcoran Irrigation District for 32 years, and before that working for the Alpaw Irrigation District for five years. Ms. Paddock has lived in Alpaw and the Storm Deer Creek Stormwater District for nearly her entire life. Ms. Paddock also meets the other statutory requirements to be a trustee as she is a freeholder of the district and is a registered voter in the district as well. Ms. Paddock also comes highly recommended by many stakeholders in the community. With that, I recommend the Board of Supervisors appoint applicant Shirley Paddock to the Board of Trustees of the Deer Creek Stormwater District. And I know there's several public comments, so. Is there any questions or comments from staff or board members rather? Okay, uh, public uh, comments on this matter, please come forward this time. Give us your name and address. Good morning. Good morning. Lauren Lane, Baker Manick and Jensen, 5260 North Palm Avenue, Suite 421 in Fresno, California, 93704. I serve as legal counsel for the Deer Creek Stormwater District and just was happy to answer any questions and give you a little bit of background. Just wanted to thank uh, the clerk and county council for doing a great job working with us on this process. As was mentioned, we appointed pursuant to government code section 1780 because that's what we all thought was the way to go and we had agreed on and so now we're, we're taking a new path and um, County Council, Deputy County Council, Ms. Grunwald was wonderful in coming up with a method for appointment. So this is something new for all of us, which is great. And so we're moving forward with that. And uh, just so you know, Ms. Mraz did resign only for the purpose of um, correcting the appointment so that we followed the new procedure. Uh, I was unaware of the new applicants. I, I don't know um, Ms. Shirley, but I'm sure she'd make a great uh, member of the Board of Trustees. But just wanted to let you know that was the reason for the resignation. And also we do have an election this year. Uh, we have two members, two trustees up for election this year of the three member board. So that'll be coming back uh, for regular election under the county uh, this November. But happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Is, is the uh, elections, are those district or at large? They, so the elections are run through the county, and as uh, was mentioned, you have to be a freeholder of land, uh, a resident, and a uh, registered voter within the district. They are the at large. They're not large. broken up into districts. Correct. I believe there's only 224 registered voters in the uh, district. Yeah, it's difficult to find residents in the district as a stormwater district. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Lauren. Anybody else wishing to address this morning? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Jason Truppian, Consors and Conway, uh, 219 North Dowdy Street, Hanford, California, 93230. I'd just like to uh, read a letter um, by the manager of the Alpaw Irrigation District um, to give a little bit of history about uh, Deer Creek Stormwater District. Uh, dear, uh, to Larry County Board of Supervisors, the Alpaw Irrigation District is aware that there's a vacancy on the Board of Trustees and the Deer Creek Stormwater District. As a result of the resignation of Ms. Sandra Mraz on March 30th, Deer Creek has requested the Tulare County Board of Supervisors appoint a director to fill such a vacancy, pursuant to the requirements of the Stormwater District Act of 1909. Ironically, Deer Creek is recommending that Ms. Raz be appointed the Board of Supervisors to fill the seat uh, vacated in an attempt to remedy a prior legal appointment. Uh, the Alpaw Irrigation District is also aware that the several other qualified residents of the district are seeking appointment by the Board of Supervisors for such a seat. For the past 17 months during uh, Ms. Mraz's tenure, the Board of District, uh, the District Board of Su uh, Directors, uh, sorry, the funds and other uh, assets of the district uh, have been systematically diver uh, diverted from the district for the benefit of outside interests and to the detriment of the district landowners and their property. For example, on May 7th, 2015, the district held over $400,000 in assets. Over the following 17 months, the district board of trustees has squandered virtually all of those funds, much from which have been for the benefit of the Angiola Water District, which is a water district uh, that exports water from Tulare County to Kings County interests, which is under the same management and located in the same offices as Deer Creek in Corcoran, California. Instead of using the district's resources to protect its landowners from the effects of stormwater, uh, the current Board of Trustees has used the money to condemn property from landowners in the, in the district, annex hundreds if not thousands of acres in Kings County, and form and participate a groundwater sustainability agency. 
None of these activities in any way are designed to protect the landowners and lands within the district from storm or flood waters, but instead promote the export of groundwater outside Tulare and the Tule Subbasin. Alpaw Ir Irrigation District would like, to, would like you to consider the following historical facts when considering the appointment of a trustee to the Deer Creek Stormwater District. For district management, the district was formed under the act of, uh, on June 11, 1909, the order forming the Deer Creek Stormwater District. Uh, it states that the intention to form a, its intention is to form a stormwater district for the purpose of protecting the lands therein from damage from stormwater and from water of those certain uh, navigable streams and water courses known as, the, uh, known as and called Deer Creek and Poso Creek under the act of the legislator of the state of California approved March 13, 1909. Uh, the act also states that its purpose is to provide for the formation, organization, uh, and government of districts to be known as stormwater districts for the purpose of protecting the lands therein from damage and soil erosion caused by stormwater and other waters from the waters of any navigable stream, watercourses, canyons, or wash for the construction of the necessary works of protection by said district and for the levying of taxes and assessments to pay for the cost constructing repair and maintaining such improvements. Uh, that's the Water Code Appendix, Chapter 13, and Section Act 13, uh, 1300 Note. So after years of being uh, a defunct district, the Board of uh, Trustees of the district was reconstituted by the Tulare Board of Supervisors on April 22, 2014. The district was reconstituted to provide the protections and services identified in the order and the act for the southwest portion of the Tulare County, uh, portion of Tulare County, which otherwise does not receive flood control protection from the County of Tulare. After years of being defunct, the facilities of the district, including levees and other protective facilities, are in need of repair. The communities of Allensworth, of Allensworth and Alpaw and surrounding agricultural developments depending, uh, depend on the district for the protection from uh, floodwaters. Despite the need for improvements, maintaining uh, maintenance and repair of the facilities and infrastructure within the district, the trustees of the district have nearly bankrupt the district without performing any stormwater or floodwater protection activities. Soon after reconstituting, the district held a cash asset of $375,825.51. On or about October 7th, 2014, those cash assets increased to approximately $404,880.65 on or about May 7th, uh, 2015. Jason, are you about finished up? Um, can you, cause you, can you kind of wrap it up? We usually hold these to three minute uh, time frames for, for public comments. Well, I can submit the rest of the, to the board. You can submit Thank that you. to the, Thank you for the, to time. the, to the clerk, yes. Thank you. Anybody else wish to address the board this morning? Yes, sir. <coughs> My name's Ron Faulkner. I live at 736 West Davis and Exeter. I'm Mr. Crocker's district, and my business is in Mr. Vanderpool's district. Wade Magnum uh, has threw his hat in the ring for this position, too. He has eight years' experience in other water districts. Uh, I have been to, the, to that meeting out there myself. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be straightened up on that, in that district out there. He's been working for me for eight years. He's very dependable. He's real knowledgeable. He has brought stuff to my attention of what goes on out there as far as the water being diverted. I really believe he would be a good asset to this board out there because of his, because of his background. You know, he lives in the area, of course. He knows where the water's going. He's been fighting to get some of this water and stuff stopped where he is going. So I really believe he'd, he, you know, he would be a real, real good access. A, a, a to this board. Thank you. And not, don't forget also what was mentioned earlier, there was going to be an election for two of those seats coming up in November. Now, now will that be a ballot election? Yes, yes it is. Yes, it will. General, it'll be on the general election. General election. Which means the filing period is July. Yes. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be, so it's going to be in November, so it would be July. Yeah. And it's going to be, it's going to be a ballot election just for that district. Yes. Correct. Just yes. for that. Correct. Okay. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to address us this morning? Seeing no, I'll bring it back to the board for action. Mr. Chair, I'll just also make uh, a couple comments on this. Um, you know, as we saw in, in 2017, uh, flooding can be very serious. Uh, and this part of the county, uh, a lot of people didn't really get a chance to see it. Uh, 
because it's a fairly isolated area, but uh, the flooding that occurred out there uh, during that year was very significant um, and had this district uh, done some uh, uh, proactive measures, uh, I think the impacts to agriculture could have been uh, a lot uh, uh, less impactful. But uh, I will say that uh, I did receive several qualified uh, applicants for this position. Um, I know that uh, uh, there's a real interest in the community to make sure that this gets uh, uh, rectified uh, and kind of straightened out. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, Chairman, that uh, there is an election in November. Uh, there, there are two seats that are coming up and going to be available to be filled. So I encourage anyone who's interested and very passionate about this uh, to run. I just made the, the best choice that I could from a, a list of uh, applicants that came my way that all had uh, uh, some experience they could bring to the table. So I'm, I'm happy to uh, uh, continue on with my uh, recommendation. Uh, and, motion. Uh, I will make the formal motion to uh, motion. Is there a second? Second, second by a motion by Supervisor uh, Vanderpool, second by Supervisor Crocker. Just cast your votes, and the votes are unanimous. Thank you, Council. We need to close session. That concludes our general session. Open session. Yes, we uh, have items on for closed session. Items B and D. Items A, C, and E are off calendar. Very good. Thank you all. Thanks for being here. Support to be in closed session. For closed session item B, the Board of Supervisors voted to authorize the defense of individually named defendants, including those to be named later, with a reservation of right in the case of Fernando Macias Ibarra, the County of Tulare, Jeffrey Allen Miller. Tulare County Superior Court case number VCU 272241. The adverse party is Fernando Macias Ibarra, represented by Daniel Prado, attorney at law. This case involves general negligence claim arising from a traffic accident involving a Tulare County Sheriff's detective. The roll call vote was made on motion of Supervisor Vanderpool, seconded by Supervisor Mike Ennis, and the vote was unanimous. <laughs>